I'm now going to hand over to Danny Bluestone, CEO and founder of CyberDuck. Hey everyone, uh, it's great to be here again. Um, so basically, today I'm going to talk about data-driven design. Um, and data has always been a huge part of what we do at CyberDuck. Um, recently, we became um, Google Analytics Certified Partners, or GACP. Um, so that's really opened our eyes um, in terms of kind of how we look at data, how we deal with data. So it's definitely um, an interesting uh, certification for a business like uh, CyberDuck. And today I'm just going to take you through uh, some of the lessons that we've learned along the way. So hopefully there'll be a couple of things that you can take away and think about. Um, so yeah, I'm Danny. Um, this is my baby. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, just a sort of random fact really. But every day um, when she comes home from the nursery, we have like this little data sheet. Um, which basically presents all sorts of interesting facts, like she enjoyed dancing, um, we can see the, the nappy changes, just sort of very sort of interesting uh, data. So, um, yeah, I just thought I'd share that with you. <laughs> um, at CyberDuck, so we deliver digital transformation powered by user-centered design and creative web technology. In a nutshell, we work with clients to help them to transform um, different products and services. Um, that they're launching. We've been going for 12 years now. We work with clients like the Bank of England, um, Mitsubishi Electric, uh, Cancer Research Technology. So we do different things for different clients, but pretty much all the work is underpinned by uh, research, UX design, kind of UI work, art direction, and a lot of technology as well. So we've got 45 staff um, and various kind of ISOs as well. So in terms of today, um, we're going to be talking about data-driven design. I'm going to share some uh, stories as well from companies like uh, Netflix, uh, Disney and DePulse. So just showing you how they use data. Um, and then sort of take you through tips. So hopefully there'll be things for you uh, to take away at the end. Um, so we live in a data-rich world. And um, this particular uh, graphic here, it's basically called the Cave of Beasts. So it was discovered in 2002 in Egypt, and it's actually 8,000 years old. But what's interesting about this cave is it's got all sorts of um, kind of data that's been engraved. So you can see that there's people dancing, people swimming in lakes, um, which basically meant that at the time there was water in the desert. Obviously, it's not the case today, but it's just fascinating what archaeologists have learned from, from that data. But they were even using like bows and arrows and stuff, um, which was essentially before it was discovered. So um, they really learned a lot uh, from that. And data is not a new thing. Uh, we've been using data, or humankind has, for over 10,000 years to just record information to help us make better decisions. So this particular infographic is quite interesting. Up to sort of um, 2003, we generated five exabytes of data. But after 2003, we generated five exabytes of data every two days. So that's a huge amount of data. And I think that these numbers are quite conservative today because this particular um, sort of research was done about 10 years ago now. Um, in fact, um, in 2011, we generated um, 1.8 zettabytes of data just in that one year alone. This particular magazine cover is from The Economist from uh, two months ago. Um, and whether we're going for a run, watching TV, sitting in traffic, every activity leaves a digital trace. Um, and basically what The Economist estimated is that a self-driving car, yeah, which we're almost there now, will generate 100 gig of data per second. And that's just one car. The main beneficiaries of all this data is artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, so for example, General Electric, um, they can predict when an aircraft is about to malfunction now from data. Uh, Google can supposedly predict the next flu outbreak, even though that's kind of being disputed um, at the moment. So this abundance of data changes the nature of entire industries. Um, 
In a recent valuation kind of of motor companies, so Tesla um, was valued higher than uh, General Motors, despite the fact that Tesla lost $770 million last year, um, whereas General Motors sold 2.3 million cars and Tesla sold 25,000 cars in the same quarter. So, so how is that possible? Is it because of Elon Musk and his profile or all the intellectual property and the batteries and sort of mechanical excellence that Tesla have? Well, basically I'm arguing that it's because of the data that Tesla generates. So it's moving towards now kind of using data to really empower self-driving technology from all the sensors traffic conditions, Tesla's taking all of that data um, and it's actually soon going to be able to make all of its existing vehicles uh, autonomous in the sense that they'll be able to drive by themselves. They've already got the capabilities to do it, they're just waiting to collect more data first. So um, the prior example shows how data is used to develop sort of new technology. Let's explore the differences between uh, big data to small data. So big data is very much unstructured. So it's basically quite often, almost often raw, um, and it needs to be mined from multiple sources. Um, in order to really do something meaningful with big data, it needs human processing, and quite often it needs proprietary sort of tools and applications to be developed to actually process that data. Um, typically, um, Big data will come from Internet of Things, sensors, or even social media. Um, so as an example, if I wanted to benchmark um, performances in uh, a theater, I could measure the, the round of applause in the audience to see which applause from which performance gets the highest volume. So it's really sort of fascinating what you could potentially do with that data, but it would take a lot of time to process and basically do something meaningful. Where small um, data is structured, um, generally it's very accessible. Um, you probably have that small data at the moment. Um, and you already have tools. For example, Google Analytics is a, is a tool. Um, typically, what would be included within small data would be things like your sales, sales um, um, presentations. We can actually look at that data and really um, learn from it. Marketing campaign reports and stuff like that. So this quote by Dan Ariely, who is um, arguably one of the world's most prominent behavioral economists, is quite entertaining. Um, because obviously we've all heard this talk about uh, big data. And I'm not saying that big data can't be useful and can't be done, but it does require a lot of planning, uh, mining, cleansing, and rationalization to really make sense of that big data. So for the purposes of data-driven design, we can utilize both quantitative and qualitative data. Um, but regardless of, sort of which approach we take, we should start with the uh, small data. So what's the difference between quantitative and qualitative data? So quantitative data is often perceived as the sort of the who, the what, the when, and the where. Yeah? Um, generally, it's number and statistically driven. Um, but sometimes, kind of, I guess, on the negative side, it can be overwhelming and very sort of technical as well. Whereas qualitative data, which is typically um, what UX kind of researchers or UX designers use, is, it demonstrates the why and the how. So it allows you to go into kind of more detail and actually come to some rational conclusions. Um, it's often being criticised as anecdotal and not scientific, and sometimes. It's not even seen as data, but if we look at the example from the cave, we can completely dispute that. So of course I, I disagree. But the very best data is always empirical, regardless of whether it's qualitative or quantitative. So what we mean by empirical is it's, um, we conduct sort of um, proper experiments and tests which are objective and, and, and not um, subjective. So here's a few um, sort of data stories. So this is Iran. He was um, one of Cyberduck's first um, um, staff members. Today he runs a startup uh, called Depulse. Not sure, hands up if you've heard of Depulse before. So a few hands. Um, it's, it's generally considered, um, you know, a very sort of well-known project management tool. Um, and basically, today they have over 10,000 paying customers. 
Uh, they work in a very sort of competitive sector where they only have a 14 day uh, trial for their products. So unlike something like Trello, there's no freemium product. So they have to be ultra efficient with their marketing and sort of um, personalization. Um, and despite the fact that they've raised um, a, a lot of money, they, they needed to make sense of all the data that they're accumulating. So in fact, every day they track two million different events in, in, their, in their sort of main uh, platform. So what they decided to do is create a business intelligence uh, platform called Big Brain, which basically data mines all of the events and everything that's happening in their application, um, and marketing as well. So all of their marketing, CRM data, analytics, it all plugs into Big Brain, yeah? Um, they've even got um, machine learning, basically, to predict, um, depending on the amount of users that come onto their website, they've obviously got, the red line is the conversion rate for, um, you know, to, from trial to paying, and the green line is, is intent, so basically they build like quality scores, so if, for example, you, you use a Mac, and you um, start the trial from a Facebook campaign, the generally you'll receive a higher quality score. So they've obviously, they know basically from previous kind of data who's going to convert better than other users. So it's fascinating. They've even developed um, an analytics kind of dashboard where they can see all of their campaigns from Big Brain, and they can see the, uh, based on the existing statistics, the, the intent and the predicted conversion rates from the various social media campaigns, and they can switch the, uh, the campaigns on and off directly from their analytics tool. And it's all using sort of some very clever APIs. In their office, as you walk in, they've got this particular dashboard where you can see the amount of paying companies, the um, annual recurring revenue, as well as sort of the monthly recurring revenues and the NPS score, sign-ups. It's just really uh, fascinating. They even have a, um, a sales leaderboard benchmarking sort of all of their top salespeople, um, how many leads they've sort of uh, brought in, how many demos they've, they've uh, run, and of course sort of the win rates per salesperson. So it's um, really interesting. Um, Netflix is um, obviously a company that you've all heard of. It was founded in 1997 by uh, Reed Hastings, and initially it was a company for renting DVDs that pretty much killed Blockbuster, as is probably most of you know. Um, and actually, the interesting thing is Blockbuster uh, refused to buy them in uh, the year 2000 for $50 million. I mean, that, that would have been a, a bargain for them. <laughs> but um, whilst um, they were very unique, Netflix were very unique in a sense that they had amazing video streaming technology, a great user experience and stuff, um, where they really sort of became a disruptor was by creating their own contents. That was the big milestone, and I'm sure that today, you know, you've all seen Netflix kind of um, uh, shows. But actually, the first show that they um, created was House of Cards. Um, and it's interesting, because um, the reason why they decided to create an American version of the House of Cards was because they had a lot of data from the uh, British version of House of Cards, and they could see that um, a lot of people were watching it. Um, what they also um, saw is that the people that were watching the British version of House of Cards were watching lots of films with Kevin Spacey as well. Um, and they were also watching a lot of um, movies directed by David Fincher. So basically, Netflix, in their algorithms, that sort of was built into something what they call as a factor. So that's when they decided to make a $100 million gamble on creating the House of Cards. And of course, it was a total... Uh, gamble um, and obviously they took that even a step further so if for example within your kind of I guess persona profile you were a big fan of Kevin Spacey the trailers for the House of Cards would feature Kevin Spacey um, a lot more than if you weren't a fan of Kevin Spacey so um, they basically they trial out different trailers with all of us depending on our viewing profile with the content that they they produce um, with season five, which is out now, did anyone get a letter from uh, the President of the United States to watch uh, season five? There's one hand up over there. Um, but yeah, apparently they also sent out customized letters depending on your, on your profile as well. So it's really how they sort of feed that into marketing is fascinating. So in a content-driven environment like Netflix, data plays a key role. 
And here are some other things that they do to maintain their edge. So with Netflix, the nice guys uh, finish uh, last. Um, so within the action and kids genre, what they found is that um, cover art featuring villains or baddies um, gets a much higher click-through rate. Um, so these are all A-B tests, and the two with the arrows up are the winners, basically. And what Netflix also found is that the more evil the expression on the face, the more click-through rates um, um, they, they would get. And actually, um, when we browse Netflix, um, we spend um, sort of almost 82% of our time looking at the cover art, which is fascinating. Yeah, so it's really kind of where they get most of the engagement. Um, and obviously, um, they did the same sort of A-B testing in different countries as well. So you can see that depending on where you live, um, you probably like uh, you know one cover art more than the other. <laughs> I mean, interestingly, I was wondering, you know, if I, if I was a Brazilian person living in England, what cover art would I get? <laughs> so uh, who knows? Um, Moving on to our next story, so from uh, sort of very humble beginnings, um, the Disney company started in 1923, so that's almost a hundred years ago now. And throughout the century, throughout sort of the last, I guess, almost century now, a lot of characters have, have, have emerged. You might recognise some of your favourite there. And at Cyberduck, we set ourselves the internal challenge to almost say, okay, if we were designing Disney's um, e-commerce store tomorrow, who would we feature as our top characters? You know, would it be uh, Disney, uh, Donald Duck? Would it be Mickey Mouse? Obviously, being Cyber Duck, Donald Duck sort of comes straight to my head. <laughs> so, so, so basically, we set ourselves a challenge to have a look online and see who the top 50 characters are. But actually, what we found is there was no definitive list of who those characters um, were for our hypothetical store. We did find a Disney kind of um, database for the top 50 kind of movies, but essentially it wasn't listing the characters, so that was just one sort of source. So before we started um, our research, we, we took a sort of um, data analysis methodology, which is defining, okay, what are we trying to do? Um, how are we going to source the data? Um, how are we going to then sort of cleanse and rationalize the data? And, and then how are we going to analyze the data to sort of generate insights? So I'm just going to take you through this now. So the, the first step was to determine the uh, data sources. We couldn't, as mentioned, we couldn't find any official leaderboard for the characters. Um, so we started to look at other sources. We looked at Amazon, um, you know, what are the most popular characters on Amazon and on eBay, for example. Of, of course, we couldn't get the sales data for those characters, but we could definitely see popularity. How many sort of Facebook likes does each character have? Um, how much content is there on YouTube per character? Um, and how many sort of mentions are each character getting on, on Twitter? We also then looked at sort of almost user-generated content or votes as well to sort of bring that into the mix. And then we wanted to also explore Google Trends. So ultimately, we were sort of trying to build a, a picture of, of all of you know the top characters. And um, we then decided to sort of sort and scrub the data. So we provided um, with each sort of, I guess, data source with a, with a weighting logic. And of course, these are all variables. You know, we could tweak and play around and have discussions on, on, on the weight. Uh, the point is, is we could really, we could build a sort of a web interface to change these variables, which would then spit out different kind of um, data as well. Um, and, and then, we, so once we sort of put the data into Excel, um, we, what we actually found is that, for example, the Facebook likes were coming in the tens of millions, whereas the, uh, the Google searches were coming in singular digits. So we couldn't compare sort of apples against apples, really. So what we had to do is, is take the numbers and transform them into a comparable format using percentages. And this is where we, where we I guess, started to see things like, okay, um, Anna and Elsa from Frozen, for example, were the most popular sort of characters at the moment, yeah? Which isn't something that we were expecting to see at all. Um, if we go back to the Disney um, film database, according to them, Lion King is the most uh, popular sort of, I guess, character, even though they, uh, it's a film. 
Um, and then according to our own analysis, we could then start to see some really interesting things. You know, that, so we combined Anna and Elsa together because they were from the same uh, movie, which is uh, Frozen. I haven't actually seen it. Um, now, and this is where we started to develop insights, you know, so Anna, Elsa and Anna were by far the most popular characters based on our research. Um, yeah, they were at number eight on the Disney movie database. Um, and there's, there obviously is some correlation between um, how recent the movie is um, and the popularity of the character. And we absolutely love Dory. Um, and Mickey is one of the oldest characters. If it wasn't for Anna and Elsa, he would definitely be number one. Um, and whilst not at the very top, if we were building that hypothetical e-commerce store, we'd definitely feature Lightning McQueen on the front page because obviously um, toy cars are a very popular category and, and um, Lightning McQueen is extremely popular on both Amazon and eBay. So um, this is a good quote from uh, Head of Audience Strategy at Disney. Um, and he basically says that Data on its own is not intelligent. The intelligent comes from recognizing what are the appropriate variety of sources for each. Um, and to be really effective, you have to understand the strengths and the quality of the different data points and understand their limitations as well. Um, so I'm just gonna take you through some of the, uh, the tips now. Um, and the first step in dealing with data is really knowing, okay, what data do you have? Uh, where are the opportunities with that data? And this is really where having the right analytics is key. So I guess the goal is really to know your data um, and how you can then sort of use that data to personalize the user experience. So um, the first thing you need to really do is um, audit and strategize your, your data strategy, I guess. Um, then you sort of implement tracking using something called Google Tag Manager, which I'll talk about, as well as sort of Google Analytics, your CRM, and then you can then use sort of various sentiment um, analysis tools and social media analysis tools, etc. Um, so what we recommend at CyberDuck for clients is something called um, a data capturing plan. Um, so to track the success and event successfully, you need a measurement plan before you implement the tracking. So essentially it would include things like the KPIs and then the different sections of your application or website or app. Um, you can then sort of break it further down by personas and then sort of the actions for tracking. So for obviously for different sections and different features, you need to have different types of, of tracking as well. Um, yeah, and obviously then you can have things like risks and opportunities and stuff like that. And um, is anyone, does anyone here use Google Tag Manager? Okay, so a few people from CyberDuck uh, put their hands up. <laughs> Um, so basically Google Tag Manager in a nutshell, it, it collects sort of data and it pushes it to third parties using uh, JavaScript. So obviously if this is your website on the left hand side, essentially you put um, one tag on your website, whereas in the past you'd have to have 20 tags for each particular sort of tool. For example, if you use Crazy Egg or something like that, you'd have to have a tag for that and a tag for this. So you just need to have one tag, which is a Google Tag Manager, and then it takes all of, um, every single event is basically managed in the Google Tag Manager console, and every time something happens, like an interaction on your website, it moves into something called the data layer, into the Google Tag Manager console, and it then reaches the third party. Um, and not only that, it actually then feeds back on, into your website as well, so you can actually invoke events as well. So it's kind of like a two-way, system and then Google Analytics I guess is used to visualize that all that data that you're capturing. Uh, Google Tag Manager is really advanced and it's a, a fantastic sort of tool. You can now use it to track every single thing whether it's on a website or app. Um, here's a simple example. So on this particular website here uh, we can detect all of the functional problems um, that are happening from the JavaScript and it then sort of logs it, so we can actually identify and find problems on, on websites and applications. This is a more uh, sort of, I guess, advanced um, example of the benefits of using Google Tag Manager. So there's a master funnel on the left-hand side, which is a 19-step registration process. This is a government uh, website, hence why they need 19 steps. Um, but basically, um, 
we, we then managed to sort of create something called mini funnels. So for each part of the funnel, there's a, there's a mini funnel that you can basically zoom into to find issues with like various fields and, and basically you can actually see where users are experiencing problems. And we then managed to get it down to 12 steps um, and in, improve the conversion rate by 10%, which is a huge success for this particular client, like absolutely massive. Um, you can even use it to visualize sort of complex user journeys to see how a user goes backwards and, or how users go backwards and forwards throughout the registration process. It's probably not too clear to the people sitting at the back of the room, um, but it's absolutely fantastic. So you can, based on the segment or where, which sort of, I guess, where the users are coming from, you know, the source, whether they're logged in or not, you can actually visualize kind of where they're going backwards and forwards. So it's absolutely fascinating. You, it, what you can also do with Google Tag Manager is track the amount of time as well, which is a screenshot on the right that it takes the user to um, finish the uh, sort of the user journey. And there's even scope. So whilst obviously this is all anonymous, you know, Google Analytics, you can't actually see usernames or who the users are. But in theory, you can plug all of this into a CRM. So it would then be almost kind of assigned, you know, the user journey would be assigned to particular users. So you could track, in a way, you know, individual uh, people's names and stuff like that. Um, so data sort of informed design allows us to use data to improve our UX and UI. And the next example is from one of my favorite websites uh, called Songkick. Anyone here um, not heard of Songkick? So Songkick is basically a website where you follow your favorite musicians. It's a bit like kind of Ticketmaster or something like that, but it's much more of a social kind of platform and uh, stuff like that. And it even allows you to buy tickets to concerts uh, there. And it sort of imports all of your um, playlists from Spotify. So you don't need to start saying, I like Michael Jackson and this one and that one. Um, and they wanted to improve their UI and UX. So basically what they uh, decided to do, um, especially around sort of, I guess, spacing and naming, um, they used a simple SQL query um, and they discovered that 99% of the most 25,000 popular artists have a name with less than 30 characters. Um, so this information is, is then used to inform the design and sort of edge cases. So it's the next screen we'll, we'll show you. Um, so you can see that um, they, they basically tested the most, the longest band name, which is the world is a beautiful place and I'm no longer afraid to die. Um, so that's a very long band name. Um, whoever came up with that name, you know, should really win a prize. But um, the point is, is if you look at the left-hand side, they, um, you know, that could go down to three lines if there, if there was a band name with a longer name. Um, then you can see on a mobile app, um, obviously you can't have such a long kind of title. So they use a technique called ellipsis, where you have like three dots that appear. Um, there's a more conventional band name, Super Furry Animals, if, if you call that conventional. Um, so yeah, um, really sort of interesting how they're using data. Um, and Spotify uses data to improve how they de both develop their product and uh, run marketing campaigns. And the Discover Weekly feature sort of learns what music users like and then pushes similar and often unknown um, artists to, to users with much success. The Discover Weekly feature became so successful that users were saying, no one knows me better than Spotify Weekly playlist. How scary. <laughs> um, Spotify also uses data to ideate clever advertising, where it tracks that on the day of Brexit, 3,700 users were playing um, the song called It's the End of the World as We Know It. Um, and I guess, you know, like Spotify, Netflix, and The Pulse, we should never rest or be happy, um, we should always want to change to kind of, yeah, just to become sort of perfect, I guess. Um, so whilst data infor informed design is how design informs data, um, this little section explores how we actually use data to decide which design is better. Um, so Cyberduck um, ran an A-B test for one of its clients called BOC, who are called the British Oxygen Company. Uh, part of the Lin Group, so they obviously supply oxygen to hospitals and, and 
And then, yeah, there's a whole audience of people that basically buy oxygens. Um, so what we did here is we enlarged the, uh, the search bar um, and actually managed to improve conversions by uh, 4%, which is a lot for that particular audience. Now, interestingly, we didn't just come up with the idea of this A-B test out of nowhere. We did sort of UX research first. We, we spoke to personas, um, customer service, team members, and stuff like that. Um, also, when you're running A-B tests, it's important that you know what sort of sample size to use. Um, so this little tool by Evan Miller is very helpful. So if you know what your existing conversion rate is, let's say 4%, um, and you want to improve the conversion rate, let's say by 3%, it will tell you how many sort of, what your sample size is per variation. So again, very helpful. Interestingly, the, um, the higher um, you want to improve your conversion rate, um, the less amount of users you need. Um, so if you wanted to make, let's say, a 1% um, you know, detectable effect to your conversion rate, you probably need about 1,000 users, for example. So that, that's quite interesting. Um, this is just showing sort of the research that we did for BOC um, beforehand um, and how we sort of ended up with that hypothesis. Um, but this is a good quote from a sort of a, a leader in visual journalism at the University of Miami. But basically, he said, look, that when we use data, we often focus too much on techni techno technological innovation and sort of wondrous coding, whereas what we really need to do is, 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 is think. Um, so just to sort of wrap up now, um, some argue that being sort of data-driven weakens, weakens decision-making. Um, and we need to be a lot more qualitative and sort of talk to people. Other people, like Amazon, argue that you have to be completely uh, data-driven. But even if you look at you know, how they work, they kind of rationalize everything with UX research as well. Um, and the next quote sort of really embodies the last section. Um, so whilst companies like Songkick and Netflix have heaps of data, they really make the data work hard. And to, to generate a sort of meaningful um, conclusion from it. Um, so, um, yeah, this is a sort of also a, quite a funny graphic. Uh, don't assume um, correlation for causation. Um, so, this is from um, Tyler Given uh, a, a, a website. But just because two things are happening at the, in the same time, like Nicolas Cage um, releasing movies and people. Uh, drowning in swimming pools. Don't sort of assume that the Nicolas Cage movies are causing people to drown in uh, swimming pools. You have to, as I said, uh, think about things. Um, so yeah, just to sort of conclude, um, a methodology for generating insights is um, helpful and a strong hypothesis is key. Uh, data is often biased or overwhelming, so focus on thinking um, and, small, and small data first. I mean, we've all experienced analysis paralysis, where you just have so much data, you don't know what to do. So in those sort of instances, it's really good to talk to users, do research, um, and just sort of come back to earth. Um, and the best teams use sort of creative, qualitative, and quantitative data approaches. So it's, it's good to use a mix of them and not sort of one more than the other. Um, at Cyberduck, we also pair our analysts with sort of creatives um, and other people who are not analysts just to sort of get a really good view of, of the situation. Um, interestingly, and I was speaking to someone earlier here about uh, GDPR, um, but for future regulation, you really do need to know how you're going to store and, and process your data. I mean, GDPR is something that's going to affect all of our businesses, and it's essentially um, the new Data Protection Act from the EU, which, you know, if we, if we don't sort of store and process data correctly, we can be fined up to 4% of our annual turnover. So it's a, you know, so every time there's a data breach, for example, you have to report that to uh, the Information, Information Commissioner's Office. So this is kind of huge news for all of us, whether, whether you know, for anyone that works with data, basically. Um, yeah, thanks for listening. Um, I'll be on the uh, panel later to answer any questions that you may have. And I'm looking forward to, to seeing um, Tasha and Anna and the, all the other wonderful speakers later. Thanks. Thank